Good evening. I'm Jeff Clements, president of American Promise. I'm very glad that you have joined us tonight for this special conversation with a friend and hero of mine, Deval Patrick. Tonight, we'll explore some themes and lessons from Governor Patrick's life of vision, compassion, leadership, and service. From growing up on the south side of Chicago, broke, as his mother would say, broke, not poor, broke is temporary, through hard work and opportunity to serve at the highest levels of American law, government, and business. Staff attorney at the NAACP, by the age of 34, a partner, and what I can personally attest was the most respected law firm in Boston, appointed by President Clinton, confirmed by the US Senate as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, General Counsel and Executive Leadership at companies like Texaco and Coca-Cola, founder of the Impact Investing Fund at Bain Capital, twice elected governor of Massachusetts, candidate for president of the United States, and perhaps the best title of all, Governor Patrick recently joined the Cross-Partisan American Promise National Advisory Council. In so many ways, Governor Patrick is not a typical politician. He brings his full life experience and lessons to inspire Americans. He speaks honestly of the pain and division, the racism and heartbreak and frustration in American politics and life. And the way all of us together can walk through this to the immense opportunity, freedom and possibility of the American promise. Governor Patrick, welcome. Thank you for joining us this An evening. Incredibly warm welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much. It seems that all your work, Governor, you've carried a deep grounding and consistent message from everything I've heard, and I've known you a long time, from where you came from. Um, it's been a part of everything you've done, it seems, and you've shared that story in a wonderful book, Reason to Believe. Um, what was life like growing up for you in Chicago in the 1950s, 60s? Well, as you mentioned, Jeff, I grew up on the south side uh, of Chicago much of that time on, uh, on welfare. And I lived with my, with my mother and sister in our grandparents' two-bedroom tenement with various other relatives who came and went. You know, I, I've, I've talked to, told the story about how my mother and sister and I shared one of those two bedrooms and a set of bunk beds. So you go from the top bunk to the bottom bunk to the floor every third night. On the uh, on the floor, um, I went to um, you know big and overcrowded and under resourced and sometimes violent um, public schools with remarkable teachers who were life changing for me for me and with whom I stayed in touch for as long as their lives. Um, and I think that the you know the, it was a time when every child was under the jurisdiction of every adult on the block, right? So if you messed up down the street in front of Ms. Jones, she'd straighten you out as if you were hers, and then she'd call home so you'd get it two times. And I think there were two lessons, and this may be what you're getting at in your question, two, two lessons that have stuck with me from that experience. One was that the adults were trying to get across to us that Membership in, co in a community is understanding the stake you have in each other, that you, you have some agency in your neighbor's dreams and struggles as well as your own. And, uh, and also that we were supposed to do what we can, you know, in our time to leave things better for those who come behind us, this notion of generational responsibility and those, uh, those aspirations, if you will, those life lessons have, um, have been uh, markers for me, milestones um, for me, and reminders um, in, you know, in that zigzagging career you described. And your book is filled with um, the smells, the sounds, the people of, of your childhood, it seems. That I'm thinking of the the, the cooking and the kitchen and the and the and the and the and the, and the ways um, in many ways it was a very rich community um, although not materially so that's true that's true and you know this was during the uh, or in the wake of the great migration so called it might as well have been the south everybody spoke southern everybody cooked southern every you know my grandparents were 
uh, in the 30s up from Kentucky. And we went back uh, to Louisville to visit relatives. And my great grandfather, you know, once a month for all the time I was growing up. Um, so there was that sensibility and that cadence that, um, uh, as I say, that we all belonged to, uh, uh, to each other. And then there was a kind of weird um, impact of, of segregation. You know, our lives, our whole lives were on the South Side. It was a very big deal to go once a, once a year downtown to the Loop, uh, to the Sears um, on State Street um, for, uh, for school clothes. Um, so that, you know, but it, it also had the, the impact, by the way, I'm not celebrating segregation, but I'm just saying that we had all kinds of people, a whole range of uh, professional um, uh, backgrounds and educational achievement all in the same neighborhood. And, and it was, you know, basically about a set of, in my household, set of old fashioned middle class values that if you work hard and play by the rules, um, you can do better. And as you, as you climb, it's, it's your responsibility to lift. Yeah. And you did work hard. You get to high school, you get a scholarship to Milton Academy here in Massachusetts, Harvard College, Harvard Law School. What was that experience like? Oh man, <laughs> I don't know if we have time for all that, but I remember I saw Milton Academy for the first time the night before classes began. Um, I came by myself, I was 14, I was terrified. I think my mother was terrified as well, but she was brave faced about it. Um, I wasn't entirely sure that Milton Academy wasn't a military academy until I, we got the clothing list for, uh, cause in, in those days the boys were required to wear jackets and ties to classes. And uh, um, so when, it, when we got the list, my grandparents splurged on a new jacket for me to take, um, uh, to wear for classes. But a jacket on the South side of Chicago was a windbreaker. So, you know, the next morning uh, after I arrived, all these boys are putting on their blue blazers and their tweed coats and all that. And I had my windbreaker and a tie from the Easter, be uh, Easter before. And I thought, oh boy, I got a lot to learn. Um, but, you know, I figured it out. I mean, I, I figured out, you know, both the, you know, the blue blazers and the tweed coats and the whole range of, you know, Brooks Brothers attire and all that stuff. I, I figured that part out. But the other thing I figured out was um, that most of the other boys were just as scared and disoriented as I was, even the ones whose families' names were up on the uh, up on the buildings, they, you know, there was a certain, and I think this is true in every new environment I've ever, ever been in. There's this, there's a, there's a kind of a code. There's an, there's a language. There's a set of understandings that people have that, you know, you can trivialize it like using summer as a verb um, at a place like Milton Academy. Um, but there's a, you know, there's a set of understandings that people have. And once someone cracks that code, um, you know, you're on your way. And I was fortunate that there were, um, there were teachers and other adults who helped me crack that, um, crack that code. I will say the, <laughs> that, you know, it's a, in a way, when I, when I got to Milton, I had you know, my new friends were interested, but just so much in my life on the south side of Chicago. And my old friends on the south side were interested just so much on my life, about my life in the, uh, at Milton Academy. And I, I, I realized I was learning a lesson that probably most people learn, if at all, much later in life. Because there I was straddling these two worlds where it felt from time to time like the price of admission to one Jeff was rejecting the other. And I had to figure out who I was and to be that all of the time, fearlessly, um, in order to move in the world in the way that I wanted to, which was, which was anywhere. And there were some costs to that and, um, you know, people you lose, but you also find people who, um, 
who are real treasures um, and uh, and you bring them and their sensibilities along. Yeah. So um, I think probably the only other thing I would say is that, um, you know, I'd always wanted to go to college. No one in my family had ever been. I was encouraged, notwithstanding that, by my family to think about college and aspire to that. And, uh, and Milton Academy and schools like it have a whole apparatus, right, to get you ready for that sort of thing and help you apply. I applied to five schools. And when the letter came that I was admitted to the one I really wanted to go to, I called home and I got, and my grandmother answered the phone. And I said, Graham, I said, I'm going to college next year. I'm going to Harvard. And she was beside herself, just excited, carrying on and all the rest of it. And then she paused and she said, now, where is that anyway? And I remember being devastated, you know, golly, how can you not know that? Um, and it was years before I, I, uh, I appreciated that she appreciated that moment, actually, much more profoundly than I did, because what she was excited, excited about was not the prestige, it was the chance, it was the opportunity. That was the thing that mattered. Um, and I, th I think, you know, those sorts of, that sort of dissonance about um, where we think that folks who don't know the scene don't actually get what's important about the scene and uh, there are a whole host of situations where we all do this. It's a great reminder to just wait to be, think about it and get some perspective. And it turns out you, there's a whole other way of, uh, of appreciating a thing or a milestone or, or an individual um, that comes into view. Yeah. Well, you know, here at the National Citizen Leadership Conference, we are all about bringing everybody into the room and your friendly dog has joined us. I want to just explain to folks that Governor is taking care of both an old young dog and uh, what's your dog's name back there? Uh, the big one is Toby and the baby is Brooklyn. Right. Call him Brooke. He's 11 weeks. Wow. The old one's 11 years. So they, they are most welcome in this conversation. I hope I, love, I hope they uh, I hope they let you do most of the talking. So. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I'm counting on the editing as necessary. <laughs> All right, Governor. Um, let's fast forward a little bit. I do want to go circle back and ask you about you know your perspective on business, where you've been at the highest levels in American business. But I want to fast forward because I think it really connects what you just said about your insistence on bringing your whole self to not be compartmentalized as one or the other or something of this or something of that, but, but really being you and bringing that to your leadership. And I think it's something we all can learn in this challenging time in the country. I just want to set the scene for folks. It's 2005. You've never run for office before. Uh, I had the privilege to be in a room with you when you are talking about why you wanted to run for governor of Massachusetts. Again, 2005, the room is packed with some prosecutors and old political operatives. And, and you, you say, as you describe your criminal justice priorities, uh, that we need to turn around from this punitive, um, sort of over the top uh, unfair drug and criminal and, and prison policies and focus on prevention, focus on rehabilitation. Um, now that is common sense today. I think it's cross-partisan support for those kind of policies. Most Americans believe in them. In Florida last year, close to, I think two thirds of the Florida voters um, approved voting rights for former incarcerated people. Um, but back in 2005, it was political suicide. And in fact, I always remember in that room uh, when you started talking about reforming criminal justice, ending racist drug policies, one of these old polls sort of knowingly said, well, Laval, you can talk about that or you can be governor, but you can't be both <laughs> and do both. And everyone sort of chuckled and laughed and you just looked at us and you said quietly, I'm serious. And the laughter ended. 
you did talk about it because that's why, you know, what you were doing is running because you had something new to say. And you pulled off a big upset of the Democratic anointed uh, candidate in the primary, a big grassroots win in, uh, in the general election and became governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, I'm gonna say one other thing and then I, I have a question about all this. Mm -hmm. um, you steer the Commonwealth, the state out of the great recession. Uh, you deal with the terrorism of the Boston Marathon bombings. You, um, you do um, implement healthcare uh, that now is a model for the nation, uh, energy transformation, so many things. And you push what you said you were gonna push, criminal justice reform, anti-corruption, lobby and ethics reform. You challenge uh, a lot of sort of the way things were done. And in 2006, when, uh, or sorry, 2010, when it was a big, big Republican year, you're a Democrat, it was a big Republican year, Tea Party, re populist reaction to economic concerns, um, Scott Brown, Republican, would soon win the Senate seat that had been held for a long time by Ted Kennedy. And yet you're strongly reelected. Big reelection win in hard time, hard times. So I thought at the time, you know, that really says something about not just you and your leadership, but the capacity of Americans to listen, um, to, to, to take hard steps and to actually want to unite and do the right thing. And I just wonder if you would say a little bit about that. Like, why did you, uh, why were you willing to commit political suicide for something you believed in? And, and what, is the, what is the lesson for the rest of us and other leaders today about that? Well, Jeff, I, I, I just, in fairness, the complete picture should acknowledge we didn't get everything right, right? Nobody does. Um, but I said what I said in that, in that room, and I can't believe you remember that um, encounter, but uh, I said what I said in that room and I, and I ran the way I did and, and governed or tried to the way I did because I think as a citizen, I had been hungry for a politics of conviction. And, and by that, I mean a, a, a politics that's grounded in a set of values. Um, I'm not talking about a rigidity that says, you know, I, as a, as an elected official, or or uh, I, whatever party I am, have a corner on all the best ideas. I just don't. It's just not real life. But um, that you choose the things you want to emphasize in the very limited amount of time that you have in a term or two. Um, and you go hard at those because they're things you think are meaningful and they are meaningful in part because that's where you are, but in part because you've been listening to other people tell you that they are. Uh, that it, and when I say other people, I'm not just talking about experts and other politically active people. I'm talking about the folks who rarely participate or have never participated, who, who aren't in every, you know, figurative smoke, uh, smoke filled room and all that, the folks who have felt like government was this abstract thing out there, it was them instead of us, right? You and me, all of us. And, and I believe it ought to reflect the best of who we are and the best of what we hope for. Um, not that I believe government can or should presume to solve every problem in everybody's life. Um, but I think like most people, because I think government has a role to play in helping people help themselves. And so that government ought to be about what people need, or at least a place to um, debate with integrity, whether government can help meet what people think they need to help themselves. So, and I had come to that um, view and, and my, my other um, sort of motivation about the importance of the long-term, this generational responsibility I was talking about, that quarter by quarter management I saw in business, um, which I think has been so harmful to the American uh, 
economy um, and to capitalism itself. I, I, that same bad habit, I think, has, uh, has been a large part of how we govern ourselves in this, in this country. It's not quarter to quarter, but it's election cycle to election cycle. It's news cycle to news cycle um, instead of generation to generation. And so the, those two things together, um, I think they're, you know, I remember I got the same reaction on, the, on what was then the new question of marriage equality. We were first in Massachusetts and it was teetering. Um, and there are a lot of people who have really strong feelings uh, about it. Um, but, you know, I kept making the point, we don't have to agree on everything before we work together on anything. Um, and that, that kind of politics, that kind of living to me is so self-defeating in the end. And, and it feels to me like we've had more than enough of it. So, anyway. Yeah, no, and you've said uh, more recently recently that our politics are broken now and leadership is failing too many of us in, in your words. Um, what did you mean by that? What, what, what do you see as the biggest pieces that are broken and what we need to do? Well, we don't have time for all that, I could tell you, but um, um, yeah, I don't think it's all broken, but I, and I, I, I will say that in a, in a kind of a serendipitous way, more of what I had been worried about seems to be on the minds of, of more people thanks to this last extraordinary year we have all had. You know, if there is a kind of an economic insecurity or uncertainty, a, um, uh, the, the isolation, um, despair as measured by um, addiction rates or suicide rates, a sense that the issues, those issues are issues at election time, if at all, and they disappear in between uh, election time. A whole lot of people in every corner of America are feeling that way right now. Those feelings and those circumstances are what black Americans have been feeling for generations. And to me, there's a tremendous opportunity for that shared reality and shared sensibility to be its bridge, its own bridge, to bring us back to a sense that we have some stake in each other, that we belong to each other, um, that national community is actually possible and that there's some things we need to do together in order to make, um, in order to make that real. So, so I, I think, you know, I'm a capitalist. I'm not a market fundamentalist. I don't think markets solve every problem in everybody's life right on time. But I do believe, you know, the private sector is where most of us work, how most of us house, feed, clothe, amuse ourselves. Um, and if you believe in opportunity, you want the economy to expand. But we should want it to expand out, right? To the, to the, to the middle and the marginalized and not just up to the well-connected. As I say, that has been happening for decades. And there's a way to rethink that, um, that I think is beginning to happen and, and around which there is real urgency on account of the pandemic. It's the very thing, I think, that an awful lot of uh, black folk have been feeling and urging for, for a long time in different terms. Yeah. Well, you mentioned you're a capitalist. Let me ask you about, about business where you have been uh, worked at, at, at the highest levels of some of the biggest companies in the world. Um, there's a lot of conversation and some controversy today about the role of business uh, and corporations in in our society, um, many business leaders in American Promise have have joined um, our national business network and signed on to this amendment campaign of American Promise with a statement that includes, we believe in a strong democracy where government is accountable to the people it serves. We believe in a strong economy where companies compete on the value they create in the marketplace. We believe in a political system based on checks and balances and an open exchange of ideas. Now, Governor, for, for good or ill, is, uh, 
as you say, business corporations are a big part of American life uh, for both good and sometimes ill. But I want to ask you what you see as the proper role for business um, in politics and for politics in business. Well, I, a couple of things I would say here. First of all, I think the I think the pledge is um, incredibly important, succinct, and uh, uh, and I'm glad that so many businesses have uh, have signed on. I hope there will be more. Um, I think that um, it's never been my expectation that. Um, or my experience that businesses could uh, could be expected or should be expected to to express themselves on every issue, but the issues that um, we're facing in this country and some of the issues you know that businesses have been outspoken on right now go right to the core of whether democracy matters um, and whether each of us has a value in that democracy. And so I think speaking up about uh, and in opposition to the voter suppression underway, this is the sort of thing, by the way, we used to, business used to just look the other way, tisk tisk, but that's not, you know, we got to sell something. Um, and I think particularly given the level of trust that much of the population has in, in business uh, as a as in one of the institutions, if you will, uh, of our society, being neutral on a question of the success of um, participatory democracy or indifferent is all wrong to me. Having said that, I hate the amount of money in politics. I think it's distorting. I think it is, um, it is, corrupting, I realize that's a pretty sensitive word to, um, to use, but when I heard one uh, former member of Congress say that you could only get a meeting with him if you had been a contributor um, to his campaign or a contributor above a certain amount of, amount of money, there's, there's something just broken about that. And, um, you know, as a lawyer, I have great respect for the idea of, uh, um, for, for the constitution and for the role of the Supreme Court in uh, um, interpreting the constitution and being the final word. But the notion that self-described originalists would find in the constitution um, that corporations were people um, entitled to um, the same speech rights that you and I as individuals uh, have is nowhere to be found in constitutional history uh, uh, or the record, or frankly, even in constitutional jurisprudence. That's a problem. So, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm not of the view that corporations should have an opinion on everything as a corporation. I'm not talking about business leaders, that's a different thing. But, um, but I would say, look, in today's world, given the trends among the employees and the, and the customers of many, many businesses, it is harder and harder to be neutral about issues that affect um, the success of our democracy, the justice in our uh, society, and frankly, the, the future of the planet. Yeah. Now, you talked a little bit about money and politics, its corrupted influence. You have been in the thick of um, electoral politics um, as you runs for governor in other campaigns and you run for president. Um, so you have a a unique, not entirely unique, but for an inside perspective on that. And I'd, I'd like to just drill in a little bit more on, on what, what, you, what you see in the system, which obviously affects everybody who's in it, regardless of if you're, if you're running for office uh, right now, uh, for any major office, super PACs, big fundraisers, lots of time raising money. 
is part of the deal. And obviously we yeah. at American Promise want to change that, but we're not pointing fingers right or left or at individuals on, on the systemic problem we need to solve. But I, I hope you can share some insight on the nature, just how, what it means to normal everyday Americans um, as opposed to sort of a, a, an abstract campaign finance issue. Like how do you see what has happened to our political system with money actually impacting the lives of everyday Americans, our communities, families? How does it actually affect people? You know, I, I, there's some studies, and this has been confirmed by friends of mine in Congress, that uh, up to 60% of a congressperson's time is spent raising money for the next campaign, meaning um, that time is not devoted to doing the business of the people who live in the district. There's something wrong with that. I mean, people on Capitol Hill are really, really busy. But when you think about the number of uh, pieces of legislative action that the American people have broad consensus on and want to happen and don't, surely the fact that their time is limited by the amount of money that has to be raised is one. Secondly, um, and you, and you know, I qualify this by saying I hate raising money. I hate asking people for money. I've tried to find every kind of way not to do it. Um, but there's a, um, I've been in those rooms where the, um, you know, the person who organized the, the, uh, uh, the event represented industry and, um, and wanted to support me because they thought I would support a particular outcome they, um, they wanted. I'm, you know, it was always about giving disclaimers and so forth, or folks who were coming to me because they already knew that I had a particular um, uh, point of view. And by the way, it's not saying that you can't be open to listening and learning. It's not to say, as I said earlier, that I felt that I had a corner on all the best ideas, but you shouldn't have to pay for that. That's part of the job, right? It's part of the job. Um, I co-chair a super PAC right now. Um, and I've been working with this super PAC on uh, grassroots engagement, how to build a permanent grassroots infrastructure, how to bring people into the, uh, into the process um, and to keep them in the process, not constant campaigning, but really frankly, community building and helping people understand they have, they have some power in, uh, in this. And I've been real clear with that, uh, with that pack and, uh, and with the donors that my objective is one day to have this pack and packs like it um, be uh, obsolete. Um, the, the, and frankly, you know, the, the expectation that the voice of the wealthy, meaning those who can write those checks, whether it's to a pack or to candidates directly, would have an outsized influence on, um, on the points of view, on the viability of candidates, that ought to worry us. That ought to worry us. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I am worried. And frankly, you know, have you seen the tabs for how much money is spent, you know, a national campaign or a, or a statewide uh, campaign? Have you never asked yourself what better uses that money could be, could be put to, especially when so much of it goes um, to, uh, you know, negative advertising, beating up on the other side. And, and I mean, I was called everything but a child of God <laughs> when I ran for, when I ran for governor. And when I think about the amount of money, even then, spent on, on TV um, to make me into something I wasn't, instead of having actually a real competition of ideas, um, I, it just it just makes you sad. Yeah, yeah. we just did a report. Uh, 2020 election was 14 billion dollars, double double what it was in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a, a report out of Maine, where Senator Susan Collins's race 
involved $200 million, most of it outside super PACs, most of it funded by wealthy donors. We, we, we uh, reported and um, almost none of those donors from Maine or live in Maine or had any interest in Maine. Mm. This is a state with less than a million voters, $200 million. Mm. And that didn't even make the top five of US Senate races in America. Um, and I, a, a, a friend, a American Promise Advisory Council member, David Trahan, head of the Sportsman's mm -hmm. Alliance of Maine, sure. uh, described it as Mainers were under an avalanche and nobody could hear us and we can't hear each other because of this outside money. And I, and I think that really summed it up. Uh, I don't think any American really thinks this is about free speech anymore, it's mm -hmm. about power uh, mm -hmm. and basically arguments among wealthy factions. Um, so I think that's why we're seeing such support for this constitutional amendment. I know we usually want the Supreme Court to get it right, but you know we now have 10 years of this, the Supreme Court clearly isn't gonna fix this and it's gonna get worse. So I, I wanna ask you, we have three out of four support, uh, three out of four Americans, Democrat, Republican, Independent support this effort. Um, I know you do, thank you. But what can we do in this divided time to leverage that cross-partisan support that shared recognition of the problem, the shared vision of a, what our, our system ought to be to impact Congress where we need two thirds vote and we need ratification of 38 states. Do you have advice for, for well, all of us out here on that? So Jeff, I, for, I first wanna say, I think you're doing a lot of what I think needs to be done. You, you are inspiring commitment. You are building community. Um, that marvelous insight that you, uh, uh, that you quoted about how Mainers couldn't hear each other. You know, when you, when you are in community and realizing that you are hearing each other, um, it's empowering and it's hard to go back. And that community being built, that's, I mean, that's what I'm interested in, in terms of this grassroots infrastructure I talked about. Um, we have to learn to talk to and listen to people who don't share the same um, point of view um, or whom we don't think share the same point of view. And we may actually surprise ourselves just how much um, in common we have. We may have different strategies for solving that, uh, uh, that um, problem, but we begin to see, we see the same um, problems and that they are worth our attention, our collective attention. Um, I think in a very, very practical way, um, alongside the issue of too much money is the issue of the hyper-partisanship enabled in part by the, um, by the gerrymandering. Every state um, in the next year or two is gonna to have to write uh, new uh, district lines or over the course of the next uh, year um, because of the um, because of the census, census results. And I think um, we should be organizing and showing up um, in state houses, um, in state capitals to make sure that those lines are drawn with um, some common sense and some uh, uh, you know, some, some sort of natural lines instead of snaking around and around. So you pick up every voter who you think already thinks like you, because the very notion of having to go and campaign in places where you are, um, you have to listen to people who differ, you have to persuade them, um, you have to come some in their, in their direction moderates our politics. And it may enable more of this notion that we can have a competition of, uh, of ideas instead of um, you know, a competition of slick ads that attack each other. So that's a part of it, in my view. And then I think um, as we build that kind of Congress, we have a better and better chance of, uh, of winning the vote in the Congress on this uh, amendment. Um, so again, taking that long view and understanding the pieces um, toward it, I think is 
is critically important. But the first thing is understanding this notion of community as having a stake in each other, which I think American Promise very much does and exemplifies. Yes, well, thank you, Governor. You've shared so much today. I wish we had a lot more time. I want to close with a question, uh, sort of a, a, a bookend to where we began at the uh, in the south side of Chicago as you growing up. And now I, I hear you're raising bees and a beekeeper. Uh, <laughs> What, what do you learn from the bees and how are they doing? Oh, gracious. You know, you, you'll, you'll learn never to ask a beekeeper that kind of question because you don't have enough time for the answer. Um, you know, I love, uh, we don't have a big operation. It's, it's four hives. Um, and uh, besides the incredible example that bees show of working together toward common goals, I love things that make you slow down. Um, for the same reason I love gardening that, you know, that make you get off your, um, your uh, usual breakneck pace and slow down. And, the, um, and being close to the earth um, is, uh, is one of the ways you are reminded of the smallness of your, uh, of, that each of us has. Um, how interdependent um, we are, uh, and um, and that there are forces at work um, that make or mire our lives in which we have some agency. So, yeah. Well, I don't think you knew this, but at American Promise, when we're all gathered together in real life at our National Citizen Leadership Conference, we usually present a jar of honey from America's beekeepers to our uh, I love that. Yeah, we're, we, we love the idea of this egalitarian, hardworking hive working together for the sweet rewards of honey. And so uh, we are going to send you your honey this year. All right, thank you. We'll see you next year in person at our conference. And uh, we look forward to gathering together again on the other side of this pandemic. So. Uh, Governor Patrick, thank you so much for all your time, uh, for your sharing of your life and lessons and leadership and uh, for helping and supporting this great cross-partisan movement of Americans at American Promise. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you to you and all of the team at American Promise for your leadership.